This is Duke University. I'm very grateful uh, to all of you, particularly, of course, to Ralph and my co-panelists, and to all of you for missing Netflix or the run-up to the football game or whatever. Um, this talk is largely extracted from a work in progress that is sort of a sequel to an earlier book exploring campus organization and management from the point of view of graduate students and the faculty. So one chapter, the last written but probably the one most widely read or assigned, addressed paid undergraduate wage labor. That became the starting point for this new project that I'm calling Monetizing the Student. The idea is to push beyond the question of wage labor to the much larger role of students in creating value in what you might call the campus economic complex, in all kinds of immaterial labor certainly, but also even when they aren't working at all. This is essentially taking a social factory approach to college experience in which such obvious flows of money and capital as debt, tuition, and wage labor are highly relevant but not our exclusive focus. I should clarify, by exploring the campus as social factory, I'm not saying that a campus is a factory in the same way that Mark compared uh, school teaching to sausage making, though that formulation kind of holds up. Instead, I'm expressing curiosity about the role of mass higher education, mass higher education in capitalism today. If the social factory is the multitude itself, and if some variant of American-style massification of higher ed is on the horizon for the global multitude, what, if anything, does the present state of American-style higher ed disclose to us regarding our common struggles and strategies? American-style mass massification of college experience isn't universal even here by any means. But some encounter with college is now a US majority experience. 80% of US students complete high school. Between 65 and 70% of these completers enroll in college immediately. So for the foreseeable future, we can expect that at least 55% of persons who enter US high schools will eventually have some college, as the demographers put it. Uh, a caveat. I know that this curiosity may not pan out into anything remarkable. Likely enough, the focus of existing scholarship is proper and sufficient, highlighting the pressing questions of social reproduction, that is, on the ways the campus functions to sort and train skilled workers, compose and legitimate class fractions, and so on. Higher education is the master's tool and there is little point to further enumerating its role in domination and accumulation unless by doing so we discover new ways of hijacking the tool for ourselves. Global college attainment is under 7%, while Americans persist to a degree five times more often. So it could easily be the case that traditional concerns about education's role in global, cl global class composition and global distribution dwarf all other considerations, rendering my own interests relatively inconsequential. In other words, if Harvard, Yale, Duke, Emory, UC Boulder, community colleges, and public high schools are devoted to legitimating the global ruling class, if all these institutions are open for business to global full payers, 10 to 15 percent of entering Emory students are Chinese full players, right? So the global bourgeoisie is swarming to our campuses. If we work primarily to consolidate global ruling class dominion and accumulation, and secondarily to help the ruling class forge networks of bonds, affective bonds, with a cadre of professionals and managers 
devoted to ruling class service as part of their personal ambitions. Does it necessarily matter that campuses are laboratories for innovation in the extortion or extraction of value? My sense is that it does matter, unsurprisingly, because college is more than a diploma and a network and a stop on the capitalist and professional managerial grand tour. I think college is a practicum in the arts of extraction and rule, where contrary to the Harry Potter myth, young corporate leaders of Gryffindor cozy up to their future patrons in Slytherin, right? That's not how Potter has it, but that's really how it works, right, on your <laughs> campus and mine. And together observe how willingly the idealist intellectuals of Ravenclaw and the dutiful workers of Hufflepuff donate their labor to social goods. But social goods they have organized to maximize the power and wealth of their rulers. By exploring the campus as social factory, I'm testing the idea that contemporary managed, contemporary managed higher education is a reasonable synecdoche for capitalist administration of the planet itself. It is a part of the system so essential that it can stand for the whole, the way a sail both constitutes a sailboat and represents it. If this is true, however, we may have to refine the dominant thread of campus resistance. That higher ed is the victim of neoliberalism. If we are as important to the system as I think we are, we are not merely victims, we are complicit partners. Take Trump. Part of our horror is our fear of organized legal brutality, the intensified victimization of campuses and the communities we sustain or study. But my theory is that Trump's brutality hits us hard in other ways too, particularly his markedly primitive modes of accumulation. It's futile at best, like the, baron, like the barons he named his son after. He has bullied, stolen, and bribed to replenish his coffers his entire career. If he could fill up on enough gold by clubbing people in the street, I think he might. This offends us. Even though the sick, impoverished, incarcerated, and dead piled up under Clinton and Obama, also fostering um, also supporting gross accumulation, we were more comfortable with them and their methods. Higher education made Clinton and Obama, but it didn't make Trump. So talking about value in higher education requires defining terms like productivity. Yeah, I wrote that. <laughs> In what sense is higher education productive? And where does that productivity come from? That productivity is certainly social in the sense of producing intangibly better citizens and numerous tangible services. But it is also straightforwardly economic. Goldman Sachs famously spent three and a half billion dollars, much of it borrowed, to buy EDMC, the Education Management Corporation, the owner of the art institutes and Argosy and so on. And they took it private at a time when EDMC served fewer than 80,000 students. How many students are on the Duke campus? Total, all students? Including all the graduate students? So a total of 80,000 students. Paying roughly $45,000 a head. $45,000 per student. Everybody on Wall Street loved this gamble. So they expected it to pay off. Wall Street expected it to pay off. Imagine the returns you'd have to expect per student if you paid 
$45,000 a head. Everybody on Wall Street loved the gamble at the time, and the new owners commenced to hire 2,600 admission staff, what we might more candidly describe as high pressure and heavily incentivized salespeople, who quickly doubled enrollment, generating around $2 billion a year from Pell Grants, veterans benefits, and so on. These public expenditures represented a minimum of 80% of EDMC's revenue. We taxpayers paid these executives bigly. At the height of this inspired leadership, Goldman took the company public again, but investors correctly anticipated regulation and lawsuits, and this offering fizzled. Before the C-level executives, that's these guys, cashed their four or five million dollar checks, their recruiting tactics generated investigations in 39 states, the Department of Justice and the District of Columbia, ultimately forcing the company to delist itself from the stock exchange. Although today it continues to educate, educate 90,000 students a year. Personally, I predict an IPO, an IPO from Goldman again, shortly after Trump gets an education secretary in place. During all of these adventures, EDMC stayed flat. Its EDMC profits stayed flat at about $2,500 a worker. For each person they employed, their profit was $2,500. That's about average for the for-profit education industry. There are companies managing $4,000 a worker in that industry and others managing just $500 a worker in that industry. But that's a far smaller margin than the 6000 average per person in retail, or the $9,000 per person in the corporate sector. So it's a low wage, low margin operation. Let's spotlight that $2,400 annual profit per worker number. Where would the value dispersed to executives at this eye-popping rate and shareholders go in a not-for-profit higher ed environment? if the accumulation wasn't in their pockets, but in ours. While some value is distributed to bloated salaries in nonprofit higher ed, <coughs> football coaches, <laughs> most nonprofit value is by definition not dispersed as profit to shareholders. Instead, it's retained as capital or spent on something, though certainly not faculty wages. How do we measure value? in nonprofit campus productivity? And how does it compare to the $2,500 or $4,000 per year per employee in for-profits productivity? I'm going to throw out some food for thought using the figures for employees and expenditures compiled by NCES, the National Center for Education Statistics. Let's use Walmart as a barometer that most aggressive squeezer of employee value of our time, but still with a more or less average retail profit of 6,000 per employee. But wait, our nonprofit higher ed numbers are huge. Right? Can you see those numbers? Walmart gets 6,000 a year, but our endowment growth is better than that. With construction, it's twice what Walmart does. Maybe we're squeezing a lot harder than Walmart. So endowment and construction, that's revenue retained as finance capital, endowment, plus fixed capital, construction. Those two silos alone amount to 12,500 per worker. So by those two measures of simple accumulation, we're not only doubling Walmart's rate, we're 50% of the corporate sector's nine grand per worker. We spend another 18,000 per worker on research and public service. So the money comes in, it doesn't go to shareholders, we shell it out. Plus another 20,000 is spent on hospitals and other enterprises. That's an incredible productivity, almost $50,000 per worker per year. 
five times better than even the corporate sector. That's why every for-profit manager is trying to figure out the secrets of academic management. Of course, we understand where some of the university's accumulation and spending power comes from. It's partly from faculty teaching for love and similar wage discounting by administrators and staff. It comes especially from part-time and non-tenure track teaching and graduate students now close to 80%. Uh, the faculty nationally. It also comes from undergraduate students directly working for cheap wages on campus and being farmed out to other employers. Right? Students' contribution to value in the campus economic complex, and those arrangements, by the way, with other employers were often formalized. It's not just casual. They will locate after they've done a deal with the university for various financial aid accommodations. So students' contribution, contribution to value in the campus economic complex includes a vast array of enterprises, from local contractors, restaurants, and nursing homes to national media corporations and global banks. At many US colleges and universities, from community colleges to Yale, the student workforce includes carpenters, guards, childcare staff, janitors, tech support, tutors, medics, graders, cooks, and dishwashers. Employers large and small cluster near college campuses in order to take advantage of this vast, low-wage, transient workforce. The low estimate for the percentage of exotic dancers who are paying tuition to a nearby college is one-third. Nationally, 80% of undergraduates work while in school for an average of 30 hours a week, meaning that any one time, over 14 million undergraduates are in the U.S. workforce, a figure larger than the official count of the unemployed. Right now it's around 8 million with another 2 million discouraged or otherwise marginally in the workforce. It's hard to imagine a federal jobs program that would not involve moving a significant fraction of this work out of student lives and back into adult employment. So adult carpenters on campus, adult dishwashers on campus, and so forth adult faculty on campus. The unionization of undergraduates is well underway. There's, I think, three or four in existence in San Diego, UMass, Amherst, you know, likely spots. Yeah, we're so out of that here at Duke, but <laughs> All right, so those very large numbers, remember, just account for wage labor. It excludes the tens of millions of unpaid and donated hours that students devote every year to nonprofits and business employers in service, le service learning, internship programs, and civic engagement. Right? That's the extorted donation. But this astonishing productivity by students in labor per se, whether it is paid, extorted, or donated, is just the tip of the iceberg. The fixed capital, finance capital, and cultural capital produced by campus labor power can be seen in terms relevant to the feminist analysis of reproductive labor and the Italian autonomous notion, I don't really need to do this here, <laughs> the Italian autonomous notion of a social factory, that is, we can usually see higher ed labor power as a vast web of effort that intersects at the campus but is not limited to it. This capacious sense of social productivity generates the crucial understanding that contemporary capitalism captures profit from many activities not generally understood as labor. These include pursuits more typically associated with consumption, leisure, education, community service, and socializing. This is not a theoretical or abstract observation by academics. Many kinds of highly profitable businesses with soaring market capitalization directly monetize recreational or self-expressive social activity as in the social sourcing of revenue producing content on YouTube, Huffington Post, and other media sharing sites. For contemporary capitalism, tapping the labor power of social media goes beyond donating media content. Users also make a second, less obvious gift of countless related activities, the labor of rating content, publicizing it by passing links along, and surrounding the content with entertaining commentary. This phenomenon, the kinds of activities involved in defining and fixing cultural and artistic standards, fashion, taste, consumer norms, and more strategically public opinion, that was a quote, was notably described by uh, Maurizio Lazzaro 
as immaterial labor, a kind of labor previously reserved to privileged or professional tastemakers such as ourselves, critics, public relations and advertising workers and journalists. Now, much of that activity is the product of a mass intellectuality expressing itself in social media. For many observers, some consequences of this shift include a welcome popularization and democratization of aspects of the culture industries, including culture criticism, product reviewing, and journalism. This pervasive harvest of value by way of ordinary activities and everyday life shapes the way we understand ourselves and manage our futures, as recounted by such histories of late capitalist subjectivity as Randy Martin's, the late Randy Martin's financialization of the self. At universities with a reputation for athletic excellence, like this one, for example, unlike Emory, <clears throat> the extracurricular accomplishments and sacrifices of student athletes are readily understood as contributions to the campus brand, while journalistic accounts focusing on the football unionization discourse focus on direct revenue. More thoughtful analysts agree that the prestige capital at most campuses is more significant than any direct revenue generated by athletics. In fact, most athletic pro programs operate at a loss but are viewed by some administrations and development offices as a cheap at the price investment in the school's intangibles, such as reputation and brand recognition, which in turn can be monetized in a variety of ways. However, athletics are just one, perhaps the classical form, of the ways that students donate to the campus brand. School, school newspapers are another. So are singing groups, dance troupes, and theatrical productions. Indeed, all of the myriad student extracurricular activities make a contribution from sororities and religious organizations to student government. Any participation builds the brand. From this perspective, even organizations protesting administrative decisions can add to the campus's appeal. Free speech and free spirits survive here. Students participate in the labor and culture of administration itself by completing evaluation forms, exchanging notes and opinions regarding faculty, maintaining files of term papers, and so forth. Students donate to campus prestige capital with their postgraduate achievements. They likewise contribute value with accomplishments before they even thought about arriving in the form of their test scores, high school rank, arts prizes, and athletic victories. Blogging and Facebook time adds value. At certain kinds of schools, value to the brand is added by the time spent by students in gyms and tanning salons. The time spent photographing each other at parties publishing and circulating these photos, and so on. Party schools' reputational capital is generally earned. They don't get their reputations, which make no mistake have value, without the dedicated efforts of tens of thousands of students partying over time. Even at non-partying schools, the importance of the healthy, leisured yet studious image of students is so important that where such imagery is not generated spontaneously by student life, it has to be manufactured for marketing purposes. Which one of these photos is Kaplan online and which one is an elite residential liberal arts college? Any guesses? Which one is Kaplan? Left? Left. It looks a little contrived. Kaplan is the contrived one. All right, so I've cut out a bunch of elaboration right here. And I've also cut out a large bit that tries to demonstrate how students generate much of the value in online courses. And if you've ever taught one, you, you understand this uh, intuitively. Um, also, through study assistance, tutoring, mentoring, and outright instruction and grading through what is known in the industry as CPR, um, Calibrated Peer Response. And students provide this for free in discussion forums in both face-to-face -face and online classes. I also cut my gleeful comparison of the MOOC to the early 19th century industrial pedagogies that likewise depended on students 
teaching students. And you see these are breakout sections of that giant factory classroom. And there are little captains and lieutenants teaching slightly smaller uh, workers in training. So you mentioned it's um, an illustration of a book from a book about uh, mutual instruction, a contemporary book about it. All right, so I also cut a bit where I turn uh, this around and show that the super exploitative mode of mutual instruction, 19th century mutual instruction, also fueled in contradictory fashion social change practices, those of abolitionists, suffragettes, socialists, temperance advocates, and another contradiction we can deal with maybe later, the Klan. So labor's mutual instruction looked like this, and that's pretty much the story that Eileen shared with us. Take a couple people out for coffee. Give them the word. So if, as uh, David Montgomery put it, I did that. I asked my students to do memes. This is the only one of mine that ever succeeded. It got passed around a lot. So uh, I go on to say nice things about your students' use of political means, or mine, self-display, your students' self-display, and your students' platformed sociality by analogy to yesterday's parades, intentional cultures, and invented traditions. So if you know anything about how unions used to operate, or how any club used to operate, the Kiwanis, the Rotary, anything, the in culture of inventing traditions, uh, and this is an argument but nothing I'm not adopting this view, but many people consider the unique features of Mormonism, which appeared at about this time, uh, to reflect that deep spirit of inventing tradition that was dominant at the time. Um, so if, as David Montgomery put it, by the early 20th century, modern America had been created over its workers' protests, those protests were created in a non-school culture of mutual instruction by voluntary societies. And I project similar inventiveness by today's young workers and students in response to the America created by Trump over their protests. Looking at the intense value-adding productivity of student time, even the time not spent obviously working, raises some interesting questions about how we manage the massive resources of modern American higher education. Are we? fairly attending to the needs of undergraduate students when we allocate resources via models that overemphasize certain kinds of easily measured revenue productivity, such as grants in some disciplines or professional school tuition. Perhaps when we starve the social sciences, cultural studies, media production, and the humanities, we are cheating the students who have given us the gifts of theatrical production, of maintaining the fencing club, and of tying the institution to the community by building websites and making documentaries. Understanding students as productive, both as campus employees and as enmeshed in a campus gift economy, if you want to call it that, also raises questions about the dominant quality models. That's a, a management, it's like a wave of management thought um, that followed right after excellence. So we, all the people are like, excellence in parking, excellence in parking. That's like from the 1970s, right? Quality roared in in the 80s. And I don't think we've caught up with that yet. Um, OK. So the dominant quality models of students, uh, primarily as consumers or revenue sources, um, are challenged by thinking of students as productive. The justification for the student as consumer approach to quality management is, broadly speaking, a variant on the old claim that the customer is king. And there are certainly many, many ways in which this philosophy has benefited students and increased student power. But at too many institutions, it has too often increased the power of students according to their spending power, giving full pay students admissions benefits and better food. And we'll have to find out whether that's true in the uh, restaurant in the Chinese student uh, dormitory you're building. 
my guess would be that food will be the best on campus. We'll see. <laughs> In some ways, the quality management of student as consumer has returned many institutions of higher education to the 19th century in which the scholarship students shine the shoes of the full-paying leisure class. By understanding that students are producers as well as consumers, we are asking for a better accounting of the gifts of time and talent made by so many. If we more completely honored students' full productivity, perhaps we'd do a better job of honoring other campus producers as well and more effectively raise questions about the rationale for outsourcing and permitting. Acknowledging the student role in value creation, their teaching, grading, mentoring, coaching, tutoring, and sociability, their contributions to course design and redesign might mean that instead of collecting revenue from student participants, we should be dispersing it to them. Thank you. Produced by Duke University online at duke.edu.